Do you like sports? Do you like art? What about science? Giraffes? Giraffe scientists that paint rugby games? It's all available on Audible, the biggest audiobook site with the largest selection of audiobooks this side of the inner solar system. No need to use your boring old eyes anymore. The ears are the future, my friend. Why, you're using them right now. So check out Audible and get your listen on. Go to www.readlearnlivepodcast.com slash audible to start your 30-day free trial today. So uh, what I would do is, is come back to my earlier answer about towns and cities and say what I would love is for town planners, for engineers to think about mobility of the individual and put that at the core of what they're trying to do to try and make our, our cities uh, truly human places, um, uh, ones that we, we can be happy in, uh, because that's where most of us are going to live. Hello and welcome to Read, Learn, Live, the podcast about improving yourself through literature. I'm your acclaimed host, John Monaster, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 77, where we're only one seven away from winning it all. As always, if you have ideas for books you'd like to see featured or of authors you want to put me in touch with, you can reach me at jon at readlearnlivepodcast.com. Today, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak with author Shane O'Mara about his book, In Praise of Walking, A New Scientific Exploration. Shane O'Mara is the principal investigator in the Trinity College Institute of Neuroscience, where his research explores the brain systems supporting learning, memory, and cognition, and the brain systems affected by stress and depression. He's published over 140 peer-reviewed papers. He is a graduate of the National University of Ireland, Galway, and the University of Oxford. He was elected both as a fellow of the Association for Psychological Science and member of the Royal Irish Academy. He loves to walk wherever and whenever he can, with walking in cities a firm favorite. He particularly wants to see urban design incorporate ease of walking and movement for all into our daily lives. I hope you enjoy our conversation as much as I did. Uh, Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Read, Learn, Live podcast. I am your host, John Monaster. Very excited to be joined today by author Shane O'Mara, author of In Praise of Walking, A New Scientific Exploration. Shane, welcome to the show. It's great to be with you, John. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks so much for joining me. Uh, You know, this book is extremely up my alley. Uh, I'm a huge walker, and I I live in uh, New York City in Brooklyn, a big walking city, and I am always out and about. I haven't owned a car. Despite growing up in Los Angeles, I have not owned a car in Uh, quite some time. Very proud of that. So uh, yeah, I love walking and it was just really exciting to get an opportunity to learn a lot more about the science behind uh, how we walk and why we walk and why it's good for us and all that. So um, so really excited to talk to you. So just to kind of kick things off, just just talk about the book. What's the elevator pitch here? What is In Praise of Walking all about? Yeah, so uh, walking is one of these things that those of us who are lucky enough to be mobile on our two feet never think about. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's really, really important to how we humans have adapted to this world. Uh, and I make the case in the book that walking is really the thing that is so special for us because it allowed us to conquer the world. It freed our hands. It freed our minds. Uh, it allowed us to uh, uh, walk all over the world. We did this in the absence of mechanization. And it's overlooked. Uh, it's overlooked uh, from how we engineer our societies all the way down to how we engineer our buildings, uh, all of these kinds of things. So there's a really nice story to tell in terms of uh, the science of walking from how we walk as individuals all the way through to how we walk within societies and with others. And I wanted to tell that story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. There's that there's that huge narrative arc there to work through. Um, so, yeah, let's just talk a little bit, you know, on, on the creative side here before we hop into all that so you know i can tell you're really excited about that story just from the how passionate you sounded there i mean so why did you decide that you wanted to write a book here why was the book the right way to tell tell the story for you um i don't think there was any other way to do it is the honest truth Mm -hmm. um i think it's it's the kind of story that the population at large need to have a kind of a handle on but it's also the kind of story the policymakers need to and 
you could write academic papers on this, but they will just get buried in the in the literature. Right. I mean, what you really want to do is t tell the story in a concise format that you walk around with in your back pocket. And uh, there's mm -hmm. nothing better uh, for doing this than a book. It's our sort of most transformative technology um, yeah. <laughs> in Agreed. a way uh, and has had a profound ex effect on us. And I, this is why I chose a book. Yeah, makes sense. And, you know, this isn't your first one. You, you've written two others. And do you feel like this one was it was different at all? Or, or what was the process you kind of put together for, for writing this book? Yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll talk about the difference. Yeah, it's different for sure um, <laughs> compared to what I, I, I've written on previously. My process, though, is is one that I've, I've finally honed. Writing books is hard. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there's just no two ways about it. Even bad books are hard to write. Uh, uh, books that are throwaway that you'll never look at again. Somebody sweated for hours to put those together. It's not an easy thing right. to do. So the the kind of for these these books, what I, I tend to do is I work with a combination of blank pages, uh, with a pen, uh, with my laptop, uh, and with a dictaphone, and somehow out of that mush, uh, a book starts to appear. So typically, what I will do is I'll take out some sheets of blank paper and I'll sketch out what I think the chapter titles should be, and then maybe what the topics should be, and uh, I'll set those apart from each other. And you can kind of look at them and think, does that fit there? So you cut them up and you just move them around a bit. And sometimes you realize, oh, there's stuff there that just doesn't work. Uh, there's things that can't, just won't fit. And you chuck that away. Uh, and eventually you end up with a set of titles uh, for chapters and a kind of, a, as you've already said, a narrative arc that mm -hmm. seems to work. And then you give it to somebody else and they'll say, oh, that's horrible. Right. <laughs> and then you have right. to go back <laughs> and work on it again. Um, and uh, I've published many scientific papers, so I, I'm used to being abused by my peers for the, the lousy quality of everything that I write. So <laughs> I take uh, uh, everybody's criticisms very, very seriously. There's always something to learn. Sure. Uh, and I've been very lucky with this book. I've had uh, exceptional editors uh, at uh, the Bodley Head in the UK and uh, with Norton in the US. And uh, they... they they've shaped or helped shape a book uh, that I, th I think works. Uh, so it, this was a most enjoyable book, though, I, I have to say. They, my, my first book was a, on a tough subject close to my heart in terms of, of uh, brain function and, mm -hmm. and stress and depression and those kinds of things. And this book was just a joy to write because it's, it's a lovely story told, uh, which I'm telling about something that's intrinsic to us all. Yeah, yeah. It's got to be good when you can uh, be that excited and passionate about something that you're working yeah. on, especially with something like a book that takes so long to work through. And like you said, there's so many, you know, edits and rounds of revision and, you know, people telling you to, yeah. to fix something they think is wrong. So, yeah, and, and cutting it, uh, you know, the, the the original manuscript, that book is about 70,000 words. Uh, mm -hmm. The original manuscript that I turned in was ninety nine and a half thousand words. Ooh. And I was proud of every one of them yeah yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, um you then get, get the feedback and you get the cuts and you get the this you get the that and all and all the rest of it and it's shrunk and you kind of go oh that hurts there's mm -hmm. paragraphs i've really loved but actually they don't work um so that's kind of hard but that's okay you, you know you just have to get used to the little pinches that uh, these things uh bring with them and yeah. uh you know uh, i know the book but i'm not the expert on the kind of how it faces to the public. So you really have to take on board what it is that others are saying because they're in the game uh, as well and they, they know what they're doing. Yeah, no, I think that's smart. There's, there's that that gap, I think, is, is large. And especially with a book like this because you really make an effort to take a lot of the science and walk, walk it through us, walk it through for us and, and explain things. And so... Yeah, I think it's always good to keep that in mind that before you, you don't you don't want to veer too much in a sort of scientific paper territory, but you don't want to make it too bland. So I think you do strike that balance of let's talk about the science in a real way. And we're going to talk about the parts yeah. of the brain, but we're not going to start using vocabulary. You have to stop and look up every five minutes to figure out, you know, what's going on. So, yeah, definitely that balance. Um, all right. Well, well, let's kind of kick it off. I want to just broadly to, to start things. There's. There's a lot happening in this whole book. So maybe to to kick us off, we'll think about, you know, between 
and I didn't even realize this really, but between sitting, between standing, and between walking, sort of there's, there's a lot, like our body works in, in three very different ways, it seems. And um, the brain and the connection between the brain and the musculoskeletal system, like it, it's all, it's different in, in important ways. So maybe just kind of kick us off by talking about why that is and, and what those kind of, what the differences and the similarities are in our bodies there. And then we can kind of dig into some detail maybe. Yeah. So uh, if you if you think about the work your brain has to do to keep you sitting, it's actually kind of limited. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the, the support that you get from the environment is there. The chair is, is uh, supporting your back. Uh, you're seated. You're all of those kinds of things. So your body or your brain doesn't have to work very hard. It doesn't have to work to keep you standing. Uh, really, what it's doing is it's just keeping things ticking over. You, you said you didn't own a car anymore, but think about a car that's parked on a drive. Yeah, uh, it's it's not doing very much. Then you turn it on. Mm-hmm. It's ready for action. So think of that as, as standing, um, but it's not actually moving yet. And the difference between a car that's turned off often a car that's turned on is, is, is quite considerable. Uh, and the same thing is true. Once you stand, the brain is taking an action-oriented view of the world. It's mm-hmm. saying, you're saying, or it's saying, um, I'm about to do something. I'm going to move. Um, and if you think, why do you have a brain? Well, you have a brain really for movement. Trees don't have brains. Grass doesn't have a brain. Your hedge out the outside doesn't have a brain. Uh, animals that are non-motile, so that uh, they're sedentary, they consume their own brains. So we, we have a brain for a purpose, which is to move around in the world. And uh, when you're uh, uh, standing, your body is getting you ready for that movement. And one of the things that's really curious, uh, and we don't notice this about ourselves, but if you watch somebody who's standing, when you stand up, uh, you're doing something complicated. And as far as your brain is concerned, your body is hung from your head. Um, mm. It's not, it's, you're not standing from the feet up. It's actually a kind of like a castle in the air almost. Uh, and and uh, uh, what your brain has to do is, is get you into this upright position, uh, get all the muscles in the musculoskeletal system rigid in the right way uh, so that you can stand, so that mm-hmm. there has to be a command signal coming down, telling these muscles, get ready for action. And then when you stand up, you have to maintain balance. And balance is hard. Um, mm-hmm. So if you watch somebody standing, they sway just a little bit backwards and forwards. And and that's because uh, you're correcting for movement all the time without even realizing you're engaging in it. And then you must take a step. Yeah. Uh, and that that's uh, when your body really says, OK, we're getting ready to go here. Um, and your brain is, 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 is designed really cleverly or your body is designed really cleverly where walking is concerned because you send the command signal to walk. Mm-hmm. And typically, you don't think about it again because your spinal cord, through these magic uh, things called central pattern generators, just fires off the sequence of movement um, and takes feedback back from the surface that you're walking on. Um, And you can talk, you can gesture, you can emote, you can eat, you can do all of those kinds of things uh, while you're walking. And all you need to do is set the goal. And then you have this kind of quiet monitoring going on. Where am I? Is the surface I'm walking on stable? Are the things moving around me bland and safe, or is it a tiger coming to eat me? Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's a that's a great way of separating it out, and it, it is kind of just magical to think through. Like especially as you were talking through all this, it's like yeah, the the act of walking is just something we all take for granted. Those of us that can, and and it's a very complicated thing as you describe. Um, and so what what I found especially interesting, given that, is that sort of the common genetic origins um, that the way in which we walk is shared with many other types of animals that move that have been evolving for millions and millions of years. So there's sort of a common evolutionary basis for walking. If you, if you go back very far, even even to fish, for example. So how, how does that all work? How is that, how is that even possible? Yeah, so we're land-dwelling animals, and we have a land bias, unsurprisingly. Uh, we like solid surfaces to walk on. Yeah. Uh, walking in the water is kind of hard for us. Um, and the assumption that we make is clearly that walking evolved on land. And that's to take a very kind of narrow uh, view of what has happened in the oceans. So if you uh, go back, uh, let's say, 500, 550 million years, 
and you look at something like the Burgess Shale in uh, uh, Canada, mm -hmm. what you find there are creatures uh, like millipedes uh, uh, that are very similar to the millipedes today, trilobites, uh, the, the wonderfully named hallucigenia, um, that all had legs. Uh, um, you know, they weren't, they didn't have fins. Now, there were many finned creatures, but there were lots and lots of legged creatures. Um, so they walked around. And the question then is, what is the relationship between our form of walking as as bipeds, uh, two-legged walking creatures, or quadrupeds, four-legged uh, walking creatures, mm -hmm. and creatures that walk on the ocean floor? Um, and we can test this now because genetic technology is astonishing. Uh, the mm -hmm. kinds of things that you can do now, you couldn't do even 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, so now we know, for example, what parts of, of the genetic program control the differentiation of the muscles that allow you to, uh, to walk, that are, cause articulation in your limbs, uh, the hips, and all of those kinds of things. And you can ask a, a very simple question, so it, 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 and it gives you a simple answer. There's a complicated technology in the middle. Yeah. But are, are the genes that control walking in the fish, uh, in walking fish, similar to the genes that are present in land uh, anim animals, land mammals? And the astonishing answer is yes. Uh, there's a, a group of genes known as the Hox genes, which uh, if you delete them, you end up losing segments of your body. Um, so the, mm. these are really important genes. Yeah. They're very tightly regulated. Um, and uh, they, they, when they're expressed properly, your body segments differentiate along the spinal axis correctly. And uh, Hox9, Hox10 are involved in the specification of the musculature and the hips and the legs. Uh, and what you find is that this set of genes are identical in the mouse. They're identical to that found in the human, but they're also identical to the skate, which is a little fish that walks uh, along uh, the ocean floor. Um, and there's a, a technology known as a molecular clock, which allows you to calculate when species diverged, uh, because there's a constant rate of mutation and, and you can calculate this. And these species, uh, the, the last common ancestor for these species existed around about 425 million years ago. So this means that walking evolved in the water, on the ocean floor, and not at the edges of uh, water margins and land like uh, had been thought for mm. many decades. So nature is very conservative. When it's got a solution that works, it holds on to that solution. Yeah, yeah, which is just kind of mind blowing to me. But yeah, that's really amazing that that we're still connected to yeah. those animals in, in that way. Um, that, that's the kind of amazing thing about genetic these genetic technologies, because what, mm -hmm. as as, as uh, geneticists are surveying more and more species, what you can do is generate uh, these astonishing genetic maps of, of connectivity between species, and you end up being able to kind of classify the, the, the great kingdoms of life uh, and uh, see that they, how they must have joined together way back when, six, seven hundred million years ago, but where they diverged and where the relationships still are across all the, the kind of extant species. It's, it's, it's really, really astonishing uh, yeah. what can be done now. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then you kind of kind of move forward from that into thinking about uh, you know, to thinking more about us. So, okay, so we, we, we now understand maybe our place in the walking universe. But now let's think about, you know, just to take it to that point that, you know, what, what is it that allows us to walk from, you know, from when kids start, when babies start with nothing? You know, baby, we can't move really as a, as a newborn. Uh, there is nothing there. And then eventually we can crawl. And then eventually, you know, babies start to try and stand. And they... they and, and this is, you know, enormously difficult. It, this is just one of the hardest things, you know. And so you really talk through um, our efforts there and the way scientists are studying that and how how kids are, are managing that. So, you know, what is it about walking? Why, why are we even attempting to walk at all? What is it that kind of lights that fire under us? Yeah, so again, this is, a, a, a you know, something that hasn't been properly studied until the, the, the kind of the last uh, 20 years. Uh, and one of the great leaders in this area is Karen Adolph at New York University. Um, and what she's done 
uh, and I, I, I'll, I'll address your question in a slightly roundabout way, yeah, if yeah. you don't mind, sure. is by focusing on 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 her work, uh, is to ask the question, how is it that we make these developmental transitions? And if you think about uh, a child when it's born, of course, as you say, it's helpless. Uh, but they they fairly early on, you know, a couple of months of age, start crawling and they, they, they crawl on all fours. This is a really stable position. It's hard to fall over when you're on all fours. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's safe. Uh, uh, but it's peculiar because uh, you can't raise your head in the way that we, we humans can or, or, or we standing humans can raise your head because you have to raise it against the back of your spine. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a hard thing to do. And you can't grasp things because your hands are on the floor. But what you are doing is learning to make patterned limb movements. You're making these undulating movements of the spine. And by moving your hands forward, you're training the rotator cuffs in the shoulder or in your shoulders so that you can engage in, in other mo movements uh, at some further point in time. So what kids do is make this transition from uh, crawling. They, they learn to sit. And then they learn to grab things because their hands are free when they're sitting and they can pull themselves mm. up. And this is what's known as a, an obligate um, transition. So uh, to learn to speak, you have to be exposed to a language community. You know, you, you'll be able to engage in kind of an impoverished form of communication without being exposed to speech. But uh, to learn to walk, you don't need to be exposed to walkers. You just need to have a bit of space. Uh, and you will walk, <laughs> yeah. um, assuming that your development, you know, you don't have any developmental issues. Um, and then uh, walking itself takes a tremendous amount of learning. Um, so we all forget this, you know, if you've learned to walk between one and two years of age, which is typically when you learn to walk, you've no memory of, you know, the fact that you fell 17 times an hour yeah. or that you walked 2,300 steps per hour. Um, and that you tottered at first and to stop falling over, you had to run a bit yeah. <laughs> and then you fell. All of those kinds of things. Uh, but by the age of about 20 months or 22 months or whatever, you'd be a pretty good walker um, and you can keep this going for the next 60, 70, 80 years without 90 years more uh, without too much trouble. Um, so it, it, the transformation is remarkable and we're the only species. So just getting back to your, your earlier, your, the kind of the nub of your question, no other species occupies this niche. Mm -hmm. There are lots of quadrupeds, um, out there. There are animals that do kind of intermediate forms of walking, uh, knuckle walkers and things like this, but no other species is upright in the way that we are. So we have found a niche that we have uniquely been able to profit from and no other species has been able to come in and occupy it. And no doubt, given our uh, human centered ways, we'd be not very happy if another species came along to try and <laughs> occupy this right. niche. You know, one of the other things that I was kind of interested in, so we, we get now we're able to walk as a species, we can move around, we, you know, but, you know, once we're walking, then it comes back to like, okay, what, how are we able to make use of that? How are we able to take advantage of this thing we've now evolved into? Uh, and, you know, one of the things that you focus on is the idea of sort of the, the GPS system that our GPS-like system that our brain uh, uses. And you get into some of the science behind the different parts of the brain that are firing there. Uh, you, I mean, it, you, the example that I had thought of here was that that blind and sighted people perform about equally a test involving kind of walking through a space and returning along a path, which is sort of mind blowing to me. So, yeah, again, how are we? How is our brain constructing maps of our environment, and how are we able to successfully navigate so well? Yes. Yeah, so this this is uh, again one of those questions that's kind of not obvious. Uh, until you start to think about it and then you think, mm -hmm. oh, this is actually a kind of a difficult uh, thing to, to get a hold of. Uh, and the kind of the original thinking uh, goes back to a psychologist uh, in Berkeley in the 1940s named uh, Edward Tolman. And uh, he was curious. Uh, there was a big debate in psychology, which is very arcane now, uh, about the extent to which you had to be rewarded for uh, learning or not, or could you engage in kind of latent learning? Mm -hmm. And Tolman constructed these mazes for rats uh, to allow them to get rewards. And then he would systematically block off routes and ask how they could find their way 
to the uh, to these rewards. And what you found is rats would just find their way really, really quickly. So he made the argument that actually what they're doing is not learning motor sequences. What they're doing is learning a layout. Um, and this is the most efficient way for a brain uh, to compute our world is, is, is to have a kind of a GP. He didn't have this phrase, of course, but kind of a Cartesian map uh, that allowed you to get around uh, in the world. And it turns out, actually, there's a brain structure uh, known as the hippocampal formation within which uh, our map of the world is encoded. And we know this uh, for lots of different reasons, but I'll just give two. Mm -hmm. uh, people with Alzheimer's disease typically show damage to this structure. And one of the cardinal presenting complaints in Alzheimer's disease is a loss of spatial orientation. You don't know where you are um, and you don't know where you are in space and you don't know where you are in time. Uh, so you have the difficulty of imagining a different tomorrow. You can't remember yesterday. Every day kind of blurs into a perpetual present. Uh, and a test in hospitals is, is very often is to bring somebody with who's, who's got suspected Alzheimer's disease along a complicated route in a hospital. It's the trails test and they have to find their way back to the front door or they have to find their way without guidance uh, to the office that they were brought to deep in the bowels of the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, and very, very often, especially uh, as the, d the disease starts to progress, they just don't know where they are. They don't know how to do this. And then, um, uh, in fact, a, a, an Irish American scientist from Brooklyn, um, uh, John O'Keefe, uh, his, his parents uh, came from from Ireland, uh, made an amazing discovery for which he won the Nobel Prize, uh, which is that uh, in the hippocampal formation, you have cells called place cells. And these cells are designed because of the peculiar inputs that they get to tell you where you are in space. So they're called place cells because what they care about is where you are. Hmm. They don't care about, you know, the fact that you're standing up or that you're chewing or you're breathing uh, or anything like that. They just care about where you are. Um, and what they seem to do is give you a kind of a map of uh, three dimensional space uh, which allows you to navigate uh, the world that we're in. So it's since he made his original discovery, we now know that you've got place cells, which tell you where you are. You've got head direction cells, which tell you your orientation in space. Mm -hmm. And you also have another set of cells called grid cells, which give you a metric for measuring at least short distances in space. Put those three things together, something to measure distance, something to measure where you are, and something to measure head direction. That's the basis of a GPS. Yeah, yeah, which is pretty amazing. And especially, you know, thinking through, I think you had that example, but it's like when uh, when you're somewhere new and you suddenly realize that you're lost, it's kind of the, those place cells that are constantly firing and telling you where you are and what's going on. All of a sudden, they're not able, they, they don't have a, is it that they don't yeah, have a memory they, of that anymore? Or? Yeah, they, they haven't learned they, and they, they need to be recalibrated. So yeah. Uh, the, the question then is how you get inputs to the place cells. Uh, and actually, uh, you can have all sorts of inputs. You can have a social input. Hmm. Um, somebody tells you you're lost, you fool. <laughs> this is where yeah. you are. And they point right. you to the sign. And instantly you get an update and you say, well, let's say you're uh, in New York. And they say, you, you say, well, where am I? And they point and say, there's the Empire State Building. Yes. There, you've got a beacon. An update. Yeah. Uh, and immediately social information will update where you are, but it's combined with visual information mm -hmm. and you've got somewhere to aim for now um, because you've got the grid system and maybe the person has been very kind and said, go straight for three blocks, turn right, and it's 10 blocks down. And you kind of go, okay, that's cool, I'm there. Yeah. Um, or whatever it happens to be. Uh, so you, you have all of these differing inputs and they all converge on this one brain structure. And of course, as I said, if you have damage to the structure, um, you can't integrate these inputs, so you're lost. Uh, hmm. Yeah, that, that stuff's fascinating. And then, okay, so as you mentioned here, you gave you had your Empire State example. So let's, um, let's turn to cities, because you, you do spend a chunk of the book here thinking about what it means for humans to walk in cities now, as opposed to, you know, just kind of walking in nature or, or uh, you know, more suburban settings. So... You know, when you when you turn and focus in on cities, um, you know, you think about how things are different. So what's changed for us now that we have to navigate through cities as opposed to some other type of environment? Yes. Yeah, so cities are, I think, 
humanity's a most amazing creation. Um, we come together in unimaginable numbers. You know, when you think of uh, somewhere like Tokyo, the largest city in the world, 38 million people. Yeah. Uh, New York with, I think, 12 million or some number like that. Um, you know, these, these are amazing places. And they, they kind of underline the fact that humans are hyper social. We like being together, uh, even if being together comes with costs, like because we, we don't have much by way of space. We might be cramped in small apartments or whatever it happens to be. But yeah. Cities are a draw. And what has happened in the last 10 years is uh, a majority of us now live in an urban environment, which means that a majority by definition of the walking we'll do, will be in towns and cities. It won't be in the countryside. And I think we haven't got to grips with how that has changed us. So, you know, we're in the midst of the, the, the current terrible pandemic. Uh, and I'm sure this is true in New York. We found it in Dublin. Uh, our, our sidewalks aren't wide enough hmm. uh, to allow uh, what should be called spatial distancing. So yeah. in my own, uh, the, the, the little suburb that I live in, there's a the little village, uh, they've started removing car parking spaces um, uh, in order that people can walk safely to a breast because the footpath, or as we call it, or the sidewalk, as you call it, is whatever, yeah. a meter and a half wide. Uh, and really, now it's an old medieval place, so the, it was never that big in the first place. But cars have taken up the space. Uh, so these are the kinds of things that we haven't thought about. Uh, and you have accidents in the creation of cities. So New York for example, um, always hits the the, uh, the top numbers in terms of walkability for U.S. cities, it and, mm. and Boston and, and San Francisco, uh, and other cities aren't walkable. And what we kind of persistently uh, misperceive is that your ability to walk in a city is not down to you. Uh, it's down to the environment that you've been provided with. If there isn't a safe environment, if all you've got is freeways and there are no uh, sidewalks to walk on, well, then you can't walk uh, or you can only walk in a very limited way. But if you've got lots of parks, if you've got very wide uh, footpaths, if, if you've got all of those kinds of things and all of the amenities are close by, uh, well, then you'll walk because you can. Yeah. And Paris is about to do this. There, there There's a, a wonderful plan called the 15 minute city where um, for any location at an, in an apartment block within the peripherique, what they're trying to do is, is to ensure that you have your shops, your schools, all of those kinds of things within a 15 minute walk. So basically, you know, a kilometer and a half of, of your your front door. Yeah, which is amazing. That's what we need to aim for. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I think to me that just like you said, that is one of the important reasons why I enjoy living in New York City is that uh, I do have all of that. I mean, within a 15 minute walk or so I have my grocery stores and my post office and my bank and a really nice park. And so, yeah, having, having that all very close by, uh, really impl improves your quality of life. And nobody uh, sat down to do that in New York. You know, that's the funny thing. Yeah. Uh, cities can do this, but you know, when the master plan for New York was drawn up a couple of hundred years ago, nobody thought about walkability. A, uh, uh, they obviously, well, or they did indirectly, but cars didn't exist. You know, so the limits to movement were how far you could get on foot yeah. or uh, how far you could get in a horse-drawn horse carriage of some description, a coach or, or something like that. And then Subway came along and and cars have only been around, you know, for a hundred odd years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and you really, you know, talking through that, you, you make the case that cities that are more walkable are actually more successful in the end. I mean, it's not just like nice you know, for us or for any reason, but that they're more successful. And, and, and then you push, you know, the, the urban planners and the architects to, to think in that manner. So w what is it, you know, that, that makes that the case? You know, if you, if you were at a city council meeting right now for, for some city that was debating how wide to make a street for pedestrians and how much of that should go to cars or not, you know, what, what's your pitch here for telling them, well, you should actually make it easier for people to walk and harder for cars to get through? Yeah, so there's a temptation when you're, you're posed a question like this to go to a utilitarian answer. Well, mm. streets like this are more economically intensive. Uh, uh, people tend to be healthier. There's greater levels of social trust. Um, th th there's greater levels of social interaction. 
Uh, people have greater levels of individual dignity because they can walk around even though they're elderly and they they're on a Zimmer frame or they they're in a wheelchair or or whatever it happens to be, and I, I think that's well and true. Uh, mm-hmm. and I think those are really important things to to, to take account of. Uh, but the other side of it is, uh, and it, it's one that people don't think about terribly often. Walking is inherent to our nature, um, and when we think about how we should design things, what we really should be thinking about is how do we design things that uh, kind of provide the maximum affordance for the way we are designed to move in this world. And that the way we are designed to move is on two feet. Uh, Now, that's not to say people shouldn't cycle, people shouldn't run, um, uh, but individual mobility, um, whether you're uh, able to walk freely because uh, you're a young, healthy adult or you're somebody who's elderly and you need uh, a walking aid. Uh, the core of kind of of our mobility uh, has evolved to be uh, us as individuals moving around on two feet. Uh, and if we start with a vision that says mobility of the individual, uh, either those of us who are, as I said, lucky enough to walk, but those also who have prosthetic limbs, those who have crutches, uh, those who are in wheelchairs, if we start with that vision in mind, we will end up with a much better city, a much more beautiful city and a much happier, healthier place than if we start thinking about, well, we've got these uh, things, uh, these boxes on four wheels and we need to give them priority, despite the fact that we know they're poisoning us and they're yeah. doing all sorts of other yeah, yeah, yeah. other things to us. Yeah. Uh, so I think there's really a two pronged answer. Mm-hmm. And, the, and we need to balance the answers because uh, uh, it's easy to go to the, the, the utilitarian argument. But I think we really need to step back and think about what it is that makes us truly human uh, mm-hmm. and think about how we can design things that afford us the ability to be truly human. Yeah, I like that. I like that way of thinking. And yeah, when you frame it like that, that that is kind of what we're built for. The converse of that, you know, inactivity, sitting is not what we're built for. And and you kind of get into that. I mean, what is it about inactivity that's actually so bad for us? And and how does moving, you know, help us then? Um, yeah. So, the, so there's there's lots of answers to give, but let let's just give a a, a very simple one because we, yeah. we're running a little low on time here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you think about the great apes and you think about our ourselves, um, the great apes actually spend a considerable amount of time sitting around. Uh, they don't they don't move a lot. Mm. Uh, uh, whereas uh, evolution has ensured that movement is profoundly health promoting in humans, huh. and there are lots of reasons for this. Um, movement provides the positive stress that our body needs uh, to to uh, uh, keep it in a, in good order. Uh, an amazing uh, discovery, again, a very recent one of just the last 10 years, is that uh, there are molecules produced in muscle only when the muscle is contracting. In other words, when it's moving, uh, that diffuse around the body and diffuse into the brain and help build uh, the fabric of the body and brain, but only when you are moving. So these are called myokines. There are lots of them. Brain-derived neurotrophic factor or BDNF is one that I I talk about in the book. But there's another one uh, which I mentioned, uh, which is a skeletal myofiber one. So again, when the muscle is contracting, these these myokines are produced. And what they do is they help uh, build uh, the fabric of the blood vessels in the brain. And BDNF in particular, you can think of it as a kind of a molecular fertilizer Mm. that keeps brain cells in, in a very healthy order, keeps them talking to each other. Uh, and movement is the key for the production of these things. So, you know, what's good for the heart is good for the brain, it's good for the body. But we now understand the reasons for this as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, well put. And uh, all the motivation for us to get moving. Uh, one other thing that, that you do, you know, before we start to wrap it up, one other thing you do talk through is uh, our, the impact of walking on creativity and movement on creativity. And you have a whole section that connects through connects that which I found really interesting. You know, that's, that, that probably was the part that I was least expecting to encounter maybe in the, in the book. So you know, what is it about, about walking and creativity? What's the, what's the connection there that you talk through? Yeah, so the, it, it, there's lots of ways to think about creativity and we all are looking for little hacks that'll help us problem solve in, in various ways. And, mm-hmm. and that's, that's perfectly reasonable and perfectly fine. Um, and we've all experienced the 
hassle of sitting there trying to solve something and it just doesn't come together. Um, and it has been apparent when you study artists, poets, philosophers, mathematicians and others, lots of them walk and they walk and think and they find that walking helps the flow of thought. Hmm. Uh, and there are lots of poets who have written really beautifully, excuse me, on this. And uh, it turns out to be true. Um, so the, there are lots of ways of, of testing this, but the simplest way is to do what's known as a, as a divergent uses test. So you're brought to the lab, you sit down, and you're handed a succession of household objects or common objects. And your job is to come up with as many uses for these as you can. And there are individual differences in this. Some people are really good. They'll come up with 25 uses for a, a pen in 25 seconds. Uh, and other people are very poor at this. Uh, and it turns out, actually, the people who are very good at this tend to be working in kind of knowledge oriented professions where they, they have to engage in a lot of problem solving. Now, here's the interesting thing. If you get people to do a 10 minute walk prior to getting them to do the uh, divergent uses task, their production of ideas about doubles. Wow. Uh, so and this also works in people who are. Uh, much older. So a, a, a Taiwanese group recently did uh, this study in people in their late 60s, early 70s, and compared them to people in their early 20s. And they found that the uh, aged walkers produced about twice as many ideas as the seated uh, people in their 20s. Mm. So getting up and moving, to, to my way of thinking, provides a kind of a, uh, uh, an activation across brain areas that otherwise would have been quiescent. Um, we've talked about the challenge that walking presents. So ideas that previously were below the level of consciousness sitting out somewhere in association cortex now bubble up and collide together. And that's where you, you get your aha uh, moments right. from. Right. The inspiration. And, yeah, that sounds great <laughs> to me. That's always a good reminder that, uh, yeah, it's, it, when you're stuck just hitting your head against the wall trying to solve something that it's actually yeah. good to take Put that it down. break. Go for yeah. a walk. <laughs> yeah. Take some, get some, get some breathing room. That sounds good. Um, so, okay, so we've talked through a lot of different things here and and learned a lot. And so one thing, you know, I want to check in on is, okay, so someone that has listened to this, maybe they're going to read the book and take a much deeper dive, pull out a lot. What can people do to really operationalize that? Like, what are some key steps that people should be taking here? I mean, you know, assuming that we're all, of course, right now we're living through this particularly difficult moment. Maybe getting out and going for a walk is one of the few things we can do easily. Yeah. Uh, but in general, you know, what what sorts of things can people do? Can what what changes can people make into their lives to benefit from this information? Yeah. So the the, the first thing you must do is turn on the pedometer on your smartphone. Uh, if you haven't that on, uh, then you've already lost. <laughs> uh, we've been given this wonderful gift. <laughs> of these devices, uh, which can track uh, without us thinking about it, our walking steps. And what we know is that the average adult in a Western society doesn't walk very much, typically four and a half, five thousand steps a day, which isn't mm -hmm. which isn't a lot at all. Uh, and really, we need to be the 10,000 steps is a, is a really good, uh, you know, the, the debate about whether how good it is, but uh, I, more is better. Yeah. Uh, and I always say 5,000 steps more than you're currently doing. But you don't know how much you're doing because you don't have any memory measure. for how many steps that you yeah. walk. It's, it's just impossible. Uh, and you need to walk regularly throughout the course of the day. So sitting for eight hours and then going for a two hour walk doesn't cut it. It doesn't get rid of the, the uh, bad effects of, of being sedentary. So what you need is lots of walking right throughout the course of the day. Mm. And if you're in a in a walkable city like New York, don't uh, take taxis if you can help it. Walk. Uh, uh, if you have to drive uh, to go to the mall or whatever, park as far away from the entrance as you can reasonably so that you add in extra walking. Turn on uh, an alarm on your laptop or your tablet or whatever it is so that you get up and you move every 20, 25 minutes. Um, if you're going to get lunch at a, a, a cafe or whatever, go to the next cafe along rather than the one that you would normally go to so that you add in an extra little bit. Uh, and something that I do regularly, I take a, a, a train into town uh, and I typically get out about two stops before Trinity College where I work. And that gives me an extra 3000 steps without thinking about it. 
because uh, it's an extra 20 minutes and right. uh, it and it's an urban walk which i love <laughs> yeah yeah so you know there are lots of little small changes we can do um but then the the kind of the big issue is is how we design our towns and cities and that's mm. something that is beyond uh, you as an individual, uh, you know, policy has to change where that's concerned. So there's, you know, a kind of a two handed thing there. But what's within your control is the amount of movement that you engage in during the day. Um, I took a call uh, just to give you, a, 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 for instance, uh, last week. Mm -hmm. And I always take my phone call standing walking. Um, so this call was an hour and a half or sorry, an hour and a quarter long. And I did four and a half thousand steps uh, wow. in that hour and a quarter. Just pacing. Yeah. Um, you know, and you can do that rather than than uh, being seated. Uh, um, so you should, you know, we're not tethered to the wall anymore. You know, the way phones <laughs> yeah. used to be, you see them on the television. Right, now right, and you go, right. What's that? <laughs> yeah. uh, but now we can walk around and, and you should. Yeah. So it's just it's just it sounds like it really the answer is like integrate walking and movement into all parts of yeah. your day. Basically, and I, I think there's one thing that. that we we again a, a question I sometimes wonder about. I don't have a good answer to it. Is how many seats are there in the world? Hmm. Um, I I can see two in the room you're in, the one you're <laughs> on, and the one at the wall behind you. There is uh, yeah. the room I'm in. There's a couple. Um, you know, so we've got lots of seats. Uh, so and we built a work environment that involves being seated. And actually, what we really need is 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 good ergonomic work on designing walking desks that facilitate a degree of fluid movement during mm -hmm. the course of the day. And they're, they're, I've seen some that are really wonderful. I've seen some that aren't so great. But the, this is something, again, we need to be thinking about building into the, the, the course of our everyday lives, how we design our environment to yeah. make it easier to move around. Yeah, I've definitely seen some kind of DIY hack together uh, a walking desk with like a treadmill and then uh, something else built on top of it. But not, not There's a German even... company called Walkolution, and they oh, have yeah. a lovely desk, um, which is all it's self-powered. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's not uh, an electric treadmill, uh, and I very much like uh, the one that they do. And I've seen one or two others um, as well. But the Walkolution is kind of like a I don't know a Mercedes. It's 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 a <laughs> right. really very nice. Uh, it's a it's a beautifully engineered uh, uh, device. But anyway, but uh, that that's kind of a by the by. I think the more general comment is that having an active workspace mm -hmm. uh, is, is something that is reasonable. We have mobile computing technologies. Uh, it shouldn't take much effort to kind of redesign how we think about things so that we can move more uh, during the course of the day. Yeah, here, here. Um, all right, well, yeah, that sounds, I think that's a good place to, to wrap up because um, that was some real good advice and I, and I hope people do take that into uh, consideration. Um, so let's just let's just wrap it up and move into my our little thunder round here. Answer a couple quick questions and uh, we'll call it a day. All right. Okay. All right. Here we go. What is your favorite food and or drink? Uh, oh, my favorite food is basically anything Italian. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I know that gives me a a, a That's big good. wide you get a range lot of, of things. But maybe, yeah. Uh, but uh, I love Italian food. Um, I, I love. Uh, Roman food in particular, oh, okay. um, uh, and uh, the, the, when you go to Rome, there, there there's just wonderful food everywhere. Yeah, um, the, mm -hmm. and it's very different to the food of, of the north, or even just a bit further south in Naples. Um, so yeah, I would say uh, Italian food. Uh, what's my favorite drink? Uh, probably very good coffee followed mm. by water. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Both pretty so, cool. Uh, yeah. I've been suffering for the past few weeks because my favorite uh, coffee shop has been closed, and mm. it's in the center of town, so I can't go to it anyway. Yeah. So I can't get a good flat ride. <laughs> Yikes! Well, I, I wish you luck. <laughs> uh, I, I am not soon, a coffee. Soon. Yeah, yeah, I'm not a coffee drinker, but I yeah, I definitely know uh, from what I've heard that uh, it's tough when you're missing out on your favorite brew. But I will, I will back you up on the water. Water, I, I got a glass here. I drink water all the time, nonstop. Uh, okay, where is your favorite place you've ever been? Oh, again, I, I hate to say it, but it's Italy. Uh, uh, okay, we we go consistent. to Italy on our holidays every year, yeah. and we just love it to bits. Uh, it's uh, from 
top to toe. It's it's just uh, it, it it's just such a wonderful place. Uh, if I can give a small shout out to Ireland, where I live, yeah. my favorite part of Ireland is uh, uh, West Cork and Kerry, uh, mm-hmm. along the uh, the southwest coast. Uh, and I talk a little bit in the book about the discovery of uh, the tetrapod uh, trackway uh, down in that part of the world. It's it's a very very unusual. Uh, part of the world geologically it's it's uh, kind of unlike the rest of the island uh, mm-hmm. so uh, Italy number one Cork and Kerry number two <laughs> okay <laughs> good to have good to have options uh, all yeah. right last question if you could wave a magic wand and change any one thing what would it be and why Ooh, uh, yeah I give a variable answers to a question like this sometimes I, I would give the answer uh, let's remove all car parking in from towns and cities, mm. um, and that would be good. But actually, I, I don't think that's a good answer anymore because people still have to be mobile. So uh, what I would do is, is come back to my earlier answer about towns and cities and say what I would love is for town planners, for engineers to think about mobility of the individual and put that at the core of what they're trying to do to try and make our, our cities uh truly human places, um, uh, ones that we, we can be happy in, uh, because that's where most of us are going to live. Yeah, that sounds great. Here, here. Uh, so again, the book In Praise of Walking, A New Scientific Exploration. Shane O'Mara, thank you so much for joining me. This was a great time. John, thank you. And I appreciate the chance to talk to you. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Read, Learn, Live. If you liked it, tell a friend and subscribe on iTunes and Google Play. If you hated it, tell a friend and subscribe on iTunes and Google Play. And so it goes. 